It's been 2,000 years since the glorious light of the cross illuminated a world veiled in darkness and confusion about the character of God. And still today, the greatest need of mankind is a revelation of God's love as revealed in the life of Christ. Amazing Facts presents the Everlasting Gospel with Pastor Doug Batchelor. Coming to you each week from Sacramento Central Church in sunny California. Discover hidden treasures in God's Word today. I predict that in the last few worlds of this, in the last few years of this world's history, a debate that is going to come more and more to the forefront is the debate regarding evolution and creation. And uh, it's becoming more intense right now. You can see that there is an increasing effort on the part of some to try to say, don't even question it anymore. Science has proven unequivocally that evolution is true. And at the same time, you're finding the mounting evidence among the, the logic of the Christian science community that you cannot have all the organization and design in the world today without intelligence. And I see it moving more and more towards a fever pitch. I like to sometimes pretend that I can uh, venture into these things and understand these thoughts and I always come back to asking the question well assuming that you're not all a figment of my imagination that means that you're here and I think I'm here so we're here where did we come from you don't get something from nothing and that's the title for the message today how can you get something from nothing all of the organization and design and things that we see in the world today uh, are evidence that there is an intelligent God. Where did it all come from? How did it appear? You know, I was reading this week and I, I learned about something I had uh, never heard about before. Have you ever heard about the God particle? The God particle. Well, as I was reading this article, it was telling me that I was really wondering where I've been. There is a contraption that is being built in Europe. It's about 300 feet underneath the ground uh, under a French town called, uh, it's, I want to make sure I get these right, Crosset, on the border of France and Switzerland. This multi-billion dollar scientific experiment is called the Large Hadron Collider. Now they used to have one in Texas and I don't remember what the dimensions were but it was a tunnel oh, over a mile around. Well this one they're building, I think they must have used the same boring equipment they used on the channel that they built across the English Channel. France held on to one of those and they built a tunnel 17 miles around. Some parts of it are 300 uh, feet underground and it's filled with these very sophisticated electronic uh, components and powerful magnets. Matter of fact, one of the mag it's magnets they said is so powerful that you better not have a hammer in your hand when they turn that thing on. Because it'll just, if you're in the way, it'll go right through you on its way to the magnet. It's one of the most powerful magnets in the world that they've built. And the, the idea of this contraption with the tunnels. Matter of fact, we got a picture here on the screen next. It shows the, the underground, under the town. This, this is a 17 mile long tunnel. And uh, they got stations all along the way, and they take elevators down there. They're going to shoot particles approximately the speed of light from opposite directions and collide them. That's where they get the name the Hadron Collider. And they're believing that when they collide these particles fast enough, they're going to get something called the Higgs boson. That's the name that they gave to this effect that they believe they can create matter from nothing. New matter. Now, that's a lot of money to spend on a theory. They won't even tell you exactly how much they spent, but it's billions. Fortunately, it's not all U.S. money, but some of it came out of your pockets. The international science community, the biggest, they call this big science. It's the biggest scientific experiment in the world. Matter of fact, by the time I read the article, they were saying any time while we're sitting here, they're going to blast this thing. I don't know, it might blow the world up and end all our problems. 
They don't know what it's going to do. But they're theorizing that they're going to get matter created from this, well, they call it the God particle. Now, the reason they gave it the name they gave it is because they're trying to find a way to explain how do you get something from nothing. And when creationists begin to debate with evolutionists and they talk about all of the organization and design and the material and intelligence and systems that are in the creation, where do you get it? Now, they're trying to now say, there's this particle that is going to form. How come we've not been able to produce one iota of life in a test tube? Now, having said that, I'm really introducing a, a bigger subject. Most of us don't believe that we exist. You probably believe that you exist, and I trust you believe I exist. Uh, there are some who have a theory that everything around you is just a figment of your imagination. You're living in sort of a reality that you created. But most of us realize that you're just as real to you as I am to me. That we exist. There's this world. And when you realize that, you should also be wise enough to realize that you weren't always here. If I were to ask you, how far back can you remember? Any of you have memories of four years old and earlier? And the older you get, the less you remember of those days. And uh, anyone from three, can you still remember something from when you're three years old? How about two? Do I have a two? That starts getting hard. Two years old? Anyone one? Some of you imagine you remember something when you're one. And they say that if they hypnotize you, they can put you in your natal memories. When you're inside mommy's tummy. I don't know what you'd be remembering <laughs> at that time. But, uh, so you know you didn't always know anything. And then it should also be painfully plain to you that you will not always be here in this body anyway. Life is temporary. We're just here for a little while. We've got to make the most of our time to evaluate what the real priorities are. People are typically afraid of dying. We're tormented through life with fear of death. I'd like to address that. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Inasmuch then as children, having partaken of the flesh and blood, humans have flesh and blood, we're mortal, he, Jesus, himself, likewise shared in the same, he took a mortal body, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, now catch this, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Many people live their lives fearing death. They don't enjoy their life because they're always worried about death. Some people are, have anxiety attacks. They panic. They're afraid to leave their house. Something bad might happen. I read last week. It's almost, I, I, I just heard a fleeting report on the news, so I don't have all the details, but some lady was so panicked she didn't leave her bathroom for two years. Some of you heard about that? People live in fear. And Paul tells us here in Hebrews that the devil keeps people living in fear of death. Well, Jesus does not want you to live that kind of way. Jesus in his death and resurrection provided a way for us to not be in bondage to fear. Now, normally when we think about death, it's pretty ominous because for us, death, you turn into nothing. And if you ask a lot of people on the street, we did this back in 99 when we were in New York City. We took a camera, went around the streets, and we asked people what they thought happened when you died. And it was kind of disturbing how many people said, well, you just turn into nothing. You just turn back into dust, and that's it, and you don't know anything anymore. And in the back of our minds, I think a lot of people worry about that, and we wonder, can God make something from nothing again? Because really, that's what a resurrection is. Well, I'd like to talk about that theme with you a little bit in the Bible. First of all, I want to remind you, you don't need to be afraid of death. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. There's something to you more than your body that's growing old and our minds that get feeble. There's something that can last forever. 
Jesus said, rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell, hell being the grave. There is eternal life and there is eternal death. And we have a choice to make that will have eternal uh, consequences. Now, today we're going to talk a little bit about the resurrection of Jesus because I think there's more good theology in the resurrection of Jesus that affects every part of our life than we may consider. Jesus performed about four resurrections in his ministry. Now, there may have been more. There are four that are really cited. Each one is followed by one of greater intensity. Let's look at them briefly. One of the first resurrections that's recorded is the resurrection of Jairus' daughter. You find this in Mark chapter 5, verse 41. This little girl was sick. Jesus was summoned by the Father. Please come and help my daughter. She's at the point of death. While Jesus is on the way, his, his progress is slowed by the crowds. He stops and heals this woman who's bleeding for 12 years. On the way, messengers come from the house of Jairus and they, they say, don't trouble the master anymore. Your little girl has died. It's hopeless now because, you know, who can make something from nothing? And once you die and the cells begin to deteriorate, there's no way to reanimate them. And Jesus said to the Father, do not fear, only believe. So they went to the house. The mourners had already been gathered. It must have been quite a journey to get there because it was enough time for them to summon the local mourners. And they're beginning their mournful tunes on their lutes and, and instruments and wailing. And, and Jesus evicts them all from the house. He takes the father, mother, Peter, James, and John. They go into the little room where the little girl is. And he takes the child by the hand. This is where our verse picks up, Mark 5, 41. And he said to her, Talithai kumai, which is translated, little girl, I say, arise. He uses basically the same words that a parent uses for their daughter when they're getting up for school. Little girl, wake up, time for school. And immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. You know, when I was studying some of the information this week about this uh, great collider that they're building there in France underground, uh, something else came out in one of the articles that the Big Bang, you've heard of the Big Bang, they're talking about creation in these things, wasn't really a bang. It was more, now these are the scientists that are saying this, the evolutionary scientists, they're saying it was more like a sound, a hum, the creation was caused by sound waves, but they don't know where did the sound waves come from. Now, sound waves that traveled faster than the speed of sound somehow initiated this creation. But I seized on that and I thought, well, that's very interesting. It says in my Bible, and God said. Now, they, they haven't got a recording of what those sound waves sounded like, but I'm thinking, well, they might have something here and they just don't know it. Sometimes science gets awful close, but they just hate to admit the Bible. It struck me for years. I'm getting a little off track, but not totally. It struck me for years. I thought it was really amazing because I, um, I went to school when I went to public school and they taught dinosaurs and the evolution. And, of course, we believe there were dinosaurs, but they said the dinosaurs slowly died out over millions of years as other creatures evolved and replaced them. Well, then I remember when I w started to travel, I saw evidence of a flood all over the world. I'll never forget, I still was not a Christian, but living with my uncle in New Mexico, 7,000 feet up above sea level, there were seashells everywhere. And I said, boy, there must have been a lot of water all over the world at some point. And then I started reading more and more of the scientific evidence was saying, well, evidently the dinosaurs didn't die slowly, they all died suddenly in some great cataclysmic event. And then they say, evidently, an asteroid struck the ocean and caused a massive global flood. And I went, bingo. Massive global flood. They won't say Noah. That is a dirty word. They'll say asteroid. But they can't refute the evidence now that there was some kind of global flood. That's how you get all these fossils. Anyway, they won't say the Word of God created. They say sound waves. And then they're saying that light somehow collided and life came from the sound waves and the colliding light beams and, and the particles in the light, the God particles. Well, you know, the Bible says 
God said, let there be light. Well, <laughs> the wisdom of men is foolishness to God. That's what the Bible says. Anyway, so this girl dies. Jesus speaks. She's reanimated. She comes back to life. Now, you notice in the sequence of miracles before the miracle of Jesus' resurrection, in this sequence of resurrections, this girl had only been dead a matter of minutes, and she's raised. Next, you get to a resurrection that was a matter of hours. It's the young man of Nain. His mother was a widow. It was her only son. This funeral procession is coming out of the city. This was her only means of support, her only relative. She was going to lose her property now, had no means of sustenance, and it just broke the Lord's heart. And so um, as they're making their way out of the city, Jesus stops the funeral procession. Luke 7, verse 14. Then he came and he touched the open coffin. And those who carried him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. That sounds a little bit like what he said to the girl. Young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he presented him to his mother, and fear came upon all of them and glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. They were right. Jesus was God. He had visited their people. Now, you go from that experience where he had been dead a few hours because they had already embalmed him, and you get to the next resurrection, which is John chapter 11. What's that story? Lazarus. How long had he been dead? A few days. So you're going from a few minutes to a few hours to a few days. And of course he comes to the tomb. He tells Martha and Mary to have faith. He says, roll away the stone. They said, but Lord, by now he smells bad because he's already begun to decompose. The cells are broken down. How can you reanimate something when it's already beginning to rot? Forgive me for being so graphic, but you know, every now and then I'll hear stories and they'll say, there was a resurrection, modern day resurrection. We heard about over in the mission field, this child had died, this person had died, the missionary was there, they prayed, they came back to life. And I say, praise the Lord. But in the back of my mind, I always think, ah, I wonder if they were really dead. Come on, have you ever had those thoughts before? Maybe they just thought they were dead. I mean, we've all heard stories about people who, you know, the coroner says, yeah, they died, and they take them off to the morgue, and they're getting ready to do the autopsy, and they sit up, scare the poor guy half to death. And they find out, no, they weren't really dead. Do you know Robert E. Lee's mother died before he was born? That's right, read history. She had terrible fever. She died. They were having the funeral, had her stretched out. She sat up. She lived long enough to give birth to him then. But they thought she was dead. The breathing was so shallow, no motion, lifeless, looked like she was blue. And so when you hear these stories about resurrections, I do believe God can raise the dead. Don't misunderstand. But I think sometimes we don't know. It's like the story of Eutychus in the Bible. The jury's still out. Remember Eutychus, Paul preached too long. Eutychus fell out the window. And Paul said, don't fear. His life's still in him. And he took him up. And you wonder if he was just knocked out and Paul, Paul healed him from a concussion or if he was raised from the dead. I believe he was raised, the Bible says. What about when Paul was stoned? Sometimes I wonder, maybe they were dead and God raised them. And nobody knows. Paul was stoned. They thought he was dead, and he got up, went on preaching. You wonder if God just said, no, they think you're dead. Maybe you are dead, but I'm not done with you, so I'm raising you up. I mean, these things go through my mind. But when the cells begin to die, and uh, you've probably heard about suspended animation. They have some creatures, generally reptiles. There are some turtles and frogs, which are amphibians, that can, it appears, they totally freeze. Now, the common American garter snake, I've seen it before where they're caught by a frost, they're out in the open, and their body's just covered with ice, and then it thaws out and they begin to move again. And some of us would see that. Some reptiles, they are totally frozen. They come back to life. And they're insects and other creatures. It seems like they're totally frozen. Well, they've done some experiments and they find out they're not really technically clinically frozen because their blood, their bodies have in their cells the equivalent of antifreeze that really prevents the cell from freezing. They got frost all over their bodies. They seem like they're as hard as a rock, 
but they're not really frozen. The cells haven't died. They're just suspended. They got this built-in antifreeze. How many of you know what I'm talking about? So they've never really figured out a way to truly freeze because when the cell wall freezes, it crystallizes and it kills it. Lazarus was dead. The cells were beginning to disintegrate. And when he was raised, Jesus, he may as well have started with a rock. It would have been just as much a miracle if Jesus had taken a log and turned it into Lazarus. He was dead. He completely created new life in those cells. That was a miracle. Now you notice what's happening. Each miracle is getting to be more profound than the one before. Each resurrection is getting greater than the one before. You know Jesus told us to raise others? Yeah. He told us to raise the dead. I've wondered about this sometimes. You know, I've done a lot of funerals. And uh, I guess I can say this now, but uh, if one of our older saints goes to sleep, I say, bless their heart, I wouldn't want to bring them back. Because the next thing they're aware of is a new body and the, the, the resurrection, right? Wouldn't that be a dirty trick? Like, yeah, but you know, sometimes there's these tragedies where a person appears to die premature and their family needs them so much. And I thought, oh, Lord, my heart breaks. I think, Lord, are you wanting me? To, how would I know if I'm supposed to say what the apostle said and come forth or something? You know, and of course, I've never done that. That'd be terribly embarrassing. If you did, it'd be great if you did it and it worked. But if you said, come forth, nothing happens. You just say, well, folks, I tried, you know. <laughs> I, you don't know. I mean, I'm, I believe the Word of God, so I sometimes wonder. Do you think your pastor's crazy now? <laughs> Have you ever been at a funeral and wondered? Yeah, I mean, I believe what I read in the Bible. Jesus said, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. Cast out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. And a lot of scholars sort of spiritualize this and raise those who are spiritually dead. But no, the disciples were raising the dead, weren't they? I think we may see more of this in the last days as God pours out His Spirit. So now we're going to move on to Jesus' resurrection. I remember reading where uh, Dwight Moody, when he was a young minister, uh, he was suddenly invited to do a funeral and he had no preparation. He was actually a layman who kind of was called into ministry and so he began to read through the Bible to try and find where Jesus had a funeral sermon. He wanted to do Jesus' funeral sermons but he realized that every funeral Jesus went to he sort of messed it up and he raised them because death could not exist in his presence including his own funeral. So before I get to that though I want to establish something that is difficult. When Jesus died, was he really dead? You know, some say, think about this. Was Jesus God the Son? Can God die? If Jesus is divine, can divinity die? That's so hard for us to comprehend. Let me just read what the Bible says, and, and you just, I hope, will trust what the Word says. Romans 5, verse 6 and 8, 6 through 8. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's plain. He died again. And you know, there are scores of verses I could read that say the same thing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 and 10. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. For whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. And some will say, when Jesus died on the cross, He didn't really die. There's a couple of theories. One is, He swooned. That's kind of the old word that they use. Passed out. He was in some suspended state. That, uh, you know, when he was on the cross and they gave him something to drink, it wasn't uh, sour wine or vinegar or gall. It was actually a narcotic that put him in a coma death-like state. This is a theory that uh, has been around for years. And that when, uh, when the soldiers took him down, he wasn't really dead. They put him in the tomb. The disciples snuck in. They revived him. 
And there's just no miracle. It wasn't a resurrection. Jesus never really actually died. How many of you have heard this before? Someone wrote, any of you ever hear um, Pastor J. Vernon McGee? He's been around for years. He's actually passed away uh, a few years ago, but his ministry has been around for years. It's called Through the Bible. And I enjoy listening to Pastor McGee. Had a very distinctive, deep Southern drawl. Even though he preached in L.A. for years, he was from the South. And you could always hear Pastor J. Vernon McGee talk. It was very deep. You, those who listen know what I'm talking about, but he's a pretty good scholar. Someone wrote J. Vernon McGee one time and said, Our preacher said on Easter, Jesus just passed out on the cross and the disciples nursed him back to health. What do you think? Pastor McGee said, Dear sister, beat your preacher with a leather whip with 39 heavy strokes. <laughs> Nail him to a cross, hang him in the sun for six hours, run a spear through his heart, embalm him head to foot, put him in an airless tomb for three days, and let's see what happens. <laughs> Well, that kind of says it all, doesn't it? <laughs> the idea that Jesus just passed out. Oh, well, you... No. It says he actually had a napkin around his head. He was in an airless tomb. They pierced his heart. All his blood ran out. I mean, he wasn't just uh, fainted. Then others say, well, he did die. But because he's God, God can't die. He was always conscious through the whole experience. And you've probably heard this. Matter of fact, it's repeated in the Apostles' Creed. Jesus actually had an out-of-body experience when he died on the cross. It, most of this comes from one verse I'm about to read. They say that when Jesus died, he wasn't really dead, but he just went into another state and he began to preach to lost souls in hell to give them another chance. Have you heard this before? Well, first of all, there are serious problems with the idea that after a person dies and they get their punishment, that God is going to give them another chance. Because the Bible's clear that it's appointed unto man once to die, after this the judgment. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, after you die, instead of being judged based upon your works, you're going to be judged or rewarded based upon did Jesus come to you in your afterlife and then you accepted him, or by virtue of someone praying in your behalf or doing something in this life that's going to give you merit to save you. Once you are dead, that is it. You take to your grave your destiny. Every man will be rewarded according to his works, not according to the works of their family, not according to a second chance. So there's really problems with this theology, but this is the verse that that uh, theory comes from. For Christ, 1 Peter, sorry, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, capital S, by whom he went and preached unto the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved through water. So they say, oh, here it is. He went, Jesus died, and then through the Spirit he went and preached to spirits who were in prison and so folks say, well, it sounds to me like after Jesus died, he didn't just stay on the cross, that he went into some other state and he went down to spirits who were in prison. Evidently, those who were disobedient back in the days of Noah, folks who died from the flood, maybe didn't get to hear the gospel, he went back to give them another chance. Have you heard this? Well, yeah, it's out there. Yeah. It's not what it means. Let me tell you what this is saying. By which spirit... He preached to the spirits in prison. The emphasis here is not that Jesus, it's the Spirit went and preached to those who were in prison back in the days of Noah. Now, if you take your Bible and you turn to Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, you find that real quick. You remember this verse. This is exactly what Peter's talking about. And the Lord said, my spirit will not always strive with man forever. In other words, it was through the same spirit, Peter's saying, that raised Christ, that God preached to those who, spirits, meaning people, who were imprisoned by sin back in the days of Noah. That's all he's talking about. He's using that, that metaphor of people who were imprisoned by sin. My spirit will not always strive with man forever. He is indeed flesh, yet his days will be 120 years. So from that point, in a special way, through the ministry and the witness of Noah, God preached, 
Christ preached through the Holy Spirit to those people back then, it's a reference to the Spirit. The same Spirit that rose Jesus is the same Spirit that preached to those who were imprisoned by sin back in the days of the flood. And those who didn't listen then perished, and those who don't listen now perish. That's the emphasis there. So when it talks about the altered state, did he have an out-of-body experience? No. What was Jesus thinking while he was on the cross? Where was he? Where did he go? What was he doing? He didn't go anywhere. How do you know that? He said when Mary went to worship him, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. I mean, the first place I'd go is I'd go to my Father. He hadn't gone anywhere. Now you and I, it's, we struggle with this, but think about it. What is the penalty for sin? Penalty for sin is death. Did Jesus take our penalty on the cross? He did. If Jesus didn't really die when he was on the cross, then did he really take our penalty? Do the wicked know anything? Do the righteous know anything when they die? Does any, do the dead know something while they're in death? The living know they'll die, but the Bible says the dead know not anything. And that very day they die, their thoughts perish. Do not put your trust in princes or in the Son of Man in whom there's no help. His breath goes forth, he dies, and that very day his thoughts perish. So the dead don't know anything. So if Christ took the penalty of the lost and he died for our sins, he was unconscious while he was in the tomb. He wasn't there with a reading lamp, catching up on his reading. He wasn't out meandering through the spirit world, preaching to people as an itinerant spiritual evangelist. He died. He slept through the Sabbath, Christ rested even in death from his work of saving man. That's wonderful when you think about it. Christ even kept the Sabbath in his death. And then he told them he would rise the third day. He had said this all of his numberless times in the New Testament, Mark 8, 31. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. It was no secret that Jesus said that he was going to rise again. He told the disciples this on many occasions. So not only do, do the Old Testament prophecies say this, as Luke mentions, Jesus told the disciples this, that he was going to really die and he would rise. Could he have faked this? Could he have set it up? Could he have talked the Romans into crucifying him and hope that this whole trick or ruse would pass off? You could never fabricate something like that. And then of course the good news. After the three days in the tomb, and it was over the period of really uh, touching on three days, part of Friday, all of Sabbath, part of Sunday, he rose. And then you read in Mark chapter 16 verse 9 that Jesus rose. When he rose early in the morning on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene out of whom he had cast seven devils. Now how did Jesus rise? Who rose Jesus? You know the Bible says that he rose himself. I'm sure the Father cooperated, but read this, John 10, 17. You're making notes? You can look it up if you have your Bible. John 7, 10, verse 17 and 18. Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Now that's another thing that causes a mystery for people. How could Jesus, who is unconscious, have power to raise himself up? You'd think you'd need to at least be standing there outside your body and shaking yourself, say, okay, wake up. How do you lay down your life and raise it up? Here's my theory. There's power in the Word. There's creative power in the Word. The Word of God, heaven and earth will pass away, but the Word of God does not pass away. When Jesus told the daughter of Jairus, get up, she got up. When he told the young man of Nain, get up, he got up. When he told Lazarus, come forth, Lazarus came forth, right? And so whenever the Word of God says something is going to happen, it happened. When Jesus said, I will rise the third day, that was the same Word that rose him up. The power of His Word. Oh sure, it was sus suspended, but His Word doesn't pass away. It's fulfilled right on time. Now, 
you might say, well, you know, there's a theory that he was buried in a borrowed tomb. We're not sure exactly where it was. And supposedly the disciples came and stole the body and said that he rose. How can you really know that Jesus rose? How do you know anything? What evidence do you have? You've got first-hand evidence of your senses. If you were not there 2,000 years ago to see him rise and you don't have that first-hand evidence, what evidence do you have? You've got to have the evidence of others. Does that make sense? Is there evidence of others that Jesus rose? Well, let's look at some of the witnesses. First of all, we just read about Mary. What witnesses do we have that Jesus rose? Mary was there first at the tomb. Then that same day, on the road to Emmaus, two disciples were walking with him. They didn't know that it was him. Maybe his shroud was covering his head or, or he shielded them from recognizing him. But before the meal was over in the town of Emmaus, they recognized him and they said, Lord, it's you. They ran back up to the upper room to tell the other disciples. So he appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus. And their testimony is, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Now that's an important verse. By the way, that's Luke 24, 34. Not only did he appear to Mary, he appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus. One of them, their name was Cleopas. But they said, before that day was over, he evidently had appeared also to Peter, Simon Peter. That's why they said, he did appear to Simon. He's not making up stories. It's true. Because we saw him also. So we, there's no record in the Bible of Jesus appearing to Simon. I have a feeling it was a personal thing because remember Peter had denied him three times. So they said the Lord has risen and he did appear to Simon. Then you go to the upper room. And in the upper room he appeared to not only the twelve that were gathered there, but there were others with them. Then you've got the twelve apostles. He appeared to them on numerous occasions. And he said, I'm alive. He ate in front of them, ate honeycomb, and he ate fish. And you got the testimony of all of those men. Now, I granted some of them were fishermen, and fishermen sometimes tell stories. But one of them was an accountant, and they're very precise, right? Matthew? Matter of fact, their, their details are more precise than you usually want them. And uh, you, you, there were shepherds and scribes and all kinds of people. They all bore testimony together that he was alive. He appeared to them again by the sea. You remember when Peter went fishing with a part of the apostles and he appeared to them and he talked to them and had conversations with them. Matter of fact, over a period of 40 days, he appeared to many of them on many occasions before he ascended to heaven. At one point, he appeared to 500 of them at one time. Now, you might think, well, there's one or two people in history and they're a little cracked or they're delusional. They thought they saw him, but they had a vision. Well, here you get 500 seen in 1 Corinthians 15. I'm not reading you all these references because there's not time for that. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part of them remain to the present day, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James. Now, it's mentioned here with a comma meaning that it's separate. This is James, his brother, who's not one of the twelve apostles. He appeared to him. Then by all of the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. Now who wrote that? Paul. So not only did he appear to 500 disciples, but then he appears to Saul, who's also known as Paul. He sees Jesus alive. But that's not the last one. You go to the book of Revelation, and who appears to John? The last of the apostles in the waning days of his life? Jesus reveals himself to him, and he ends the book by saying, I am he that lives. I was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And so, if you're not going to believe this testimony, do you realize, let me just uh, get you to think about something. If you believe any ancient history, there's a lot of things we take for granted about ancient history like the existence of Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, Nebuchadnezzar, Hammurabi, um, the various pharaohs. You go through the different uh, records of history and you know there are more witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus than all these other famous characters of ancient history and yet nobody ever questions did Alexander the Great really live. There are not as many writings about Alexander as there are about Jesus and his resurrection. So, 
what testimony would you accept? You got the testimony of history, and would, would you be willing to die for something that you, if you made up a story of the resurrection, would you be willing to die for a big fabrication that you created? Were the apostles willing to die believing that Jesus had rise? Many of them did. They laid down their lives. They were tortured because they saw it. That's why Paul says, we have seen with our eyes, we have handled the word of life. We bear witness. What we've seen is true. They're using the strongest, most emphatic language that they can find that Jesus really rose. Now, I read this just last week, but there's lots of extra biblical testimony too besides what you find in the Bible. And I quoted Flavius Josephus. This is in his book on the antiquities of the Jews. He was a contemporary of Christ. He toured with the Romans. He was spared after the destruction of Jerusalem. He wrote a history of the Jewish people. He was a, a scholar. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man. Don't forget this is written by a Jew who is not a Christian. By the way, you can be a Jew and a Christian. But uh, Josephus made no profession of being a Christian, but he sounds like he believed. There was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to himself many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those who loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day as the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him and the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. So what testimony will you believe? You know, I think one reason that it's so hard for us to believe in the resurrection is because in our modern world today, and I'll tell you, you might say, I believe in the resurrection, Doug. I don't really have a problem with this. But I think we're scared of death. And you don't need to be. Because Jesus can make something out of nothing. That's the wonderful thing. You know, one of the things that gives me comfort is I can't explain how you can have a seed that is thousands of years old that can germinate after being basically dead in every sense of the word. You've heard some of these stories of ancient seeds. They found these ancient lotus seeds in a bog in Japan, of some extinct lotus flower, and they were 3,000 years old and they carefully extracted them and dried them out and wondered, what if? You think they could still be viable? If we plant them, could they live? How can you get a flower out of something that's been dormant? It's not been eating. How can it stay alive? It's not been doing anything for 3,000 years. And what do you think? They put it in the ground and they sprouted. And you've heard of Howard Carter who examined the um, tomb of King Tutankhamun. He found it. They found a pot that had some old Egyptian beans in it over 2,000 years old. Pretty close to 3,000 there too. They put them in some fertile ground with some moisture and some sunlight and they sprouted. What keeps that essence of life in those seeds? I don't know, it's a mystery, but God can make something out of nothing. And He doesn't need a particle collider to do it. Let me give you a kernel of truth. John 12, this is what Jesus said about this. Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for life eternal. What is Jesus saying here? Well, for one thing, we must become nothing and die if we're going to become something. Martin Luther put it this way, God creates from nothing, so until we become nothing, He can make nothing of us. The Lord doesn't need to start with material and transform it. Man knows how to manipulate life. We can take cells from one person and inject them into another person and have a sort of a, a symbiotic or a um, surrogate. That's the word I'm looking for, a surrogate birth. We can, we can clone and splice and slice the genes and take what God's already created. We're taking life He's already got and, you know, try to cross-pollinate and cross-breed and do things with that. We can manipulate it, but we can't take nothing and make a cell of life. We can't take nothing and make a man. I don't know how He does it. 
but I believe you can do it because you look around you and just all you see in the world today is evidence God can make something out of nothing. Again, Paul talking about the seed principle. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 36. Foolish ones, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be. In other words, if I want to get a, um, a banana, you do not plant a banana. Try it. You're not going to get a banana tree from planting a banana. It's sown as something else, but it grows into a banana. If you want a pine tree, you don't stick the tree in the ground. You've got to take the seed of the tree and put it in the ground. You don't sow that body. That shall be mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain, but God gives it a body as He pleases, and to each seed its own body. And here He's using these metaphors from nature to try and help us understand that God can take nothing and make something. When you're resurrected, what does God use to resurrect you? You know, I, I read that in uh, Japan in the 1600s there was a great persecution of Christians. Thousands were killed. The Japanese then believed, they knew the Christians believed in the resurrection, and they said, well, what we'll do is we're going to bury their bodies in one place and we're going to bury their heads somewhere else so they can't be raised. As though God is going to come down and go, oh, where are the parts? I can't do this, you know. And Is God reassembling the old parts? Is he, you know, uh, the wife of the president in South America what was her name? No, 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 they say. That famous wife of the president in South America, Argentina. Eva Perón, Eva, that's it. He had her embalmed, very expensive, best in the world. And they say to this very day, she, her body looks just like the day they laid her in the grave. And you think, oh, the Lord's going to come along and see her, assuming she's saved, and say, oh, thanks, this is a lot easier to do one resurrection like this. I really appreciate that. And well, who is it? Is it Lenin that they've frozen? Yeah. They, they got him frozen there in, in Red Square. Well, I appreciate the help, guys. If you, know, if you freeze him, it's easier for me. And others are saying, you know, I want to be buried cryogenically frozen, preserved. Just give the Lord a little help because you've heard this, right? It doesn't make any difference because none of the body you're wearing now goes to heaven. None of it. Not one brain cell. Who you are, he saves somehow. He backs up the hard drive. I don't know how he does it. But he saves who you are. God knows who you are. And he makes a new creature. That's why the Bible says all things are new. Old things are passed away. All things are made new. This is good news. John 11, verse 25. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. No, wait a second here. If we are living now and believing in him, he said, we will never die. Do Christians die or do they go to sleep? According to the Bible, they go to sleep. You don't have to worry about dying. You're just wondering when your change will be, when you're going to get the new body. That's really, and those who are alive when Christ comes, it says in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, they're changed. I know some of this sounds like a funeral service, but I'm getting into things I never get a chance to get into in a funeral service. We'll be changed when the Lord comes down. What's changed? This mortal puts on him corruption. This body is dying, it's going to die, just accept it. We're all terminal in that respect. But you don't need to be afraid because the resurrection of Jesus proves, he was dead three days, that God can make something out of nothing. Because Christ went into the grave with a mortal body like you and I have, but he came out with a glorified body. Isn't that what the Bible tells us? And that's the kind of bodies we're going to have. So, I still can't prove it to you scientifically, but I think there's a lot of evidence in the world out there that God does know how to make something out of nothing. And that's hope for you and me, because when we come to the Lord, we are nothing. We are poor and wretched and miserable, blind and naked and we're helpless. And when we realize our nothingness, that's when He can recreate us. The resurrection of Jesus is inexorably linked to living a new life. The victory that you and I have as new creatures with new hearts, 
You know, the idea of him giving you a new heart, the resurrection is evidence that he, there's a new birth that happens inside of you, a glorious new heart, a new spirit. The most important thing that you can grasp from the resurrection is God can make something out of nothing. He can take our stony hearts, take them out, and recreate a new heart within us. And all of this, it's very real. He really does give you a new heart. And also, we don't need to be afraid of death. It's like that hymn that we sing, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. You know, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh uh, is an interesting character from history, very colorful character from history. He was sort of a favorite of Queen Elizabeth for many years, but eventually uh, she passed away and he fell out of favor and the next ruler put him in the Tower of London, threatened by his position and influence, they finally consigned him to be executed. And most people don't know, not only was he an explorer and a sailor and a, sailor and a soldier, he was a poet. And while he was waiting there in the Tower of London for his execution, he wrote these words. Even such as time that takes in trust our youth, our joys, and all we have, and pays us with age and dust, who in the dark and silent grave, when we have wandered all our days, shut up the story of our days. But from the earth, this grave, this dust, my God shall raise me up, I trust. He died, he wasn't afraid, believing in the resurrection. Socrates, oh, 400 years before Christ died, he was told he needed to drink hemlock, and um, basically he was given the death sentence, and he said, I'll, I'll drink the hemlock rather than have you execute me. And after he drank it, and he was waiting for the poison to take effect. His disciples around him were saying, will we live again? He said, I don't know, maybe. But how sad to have that kind of an outlook on life. And when the pagans were buried there in the catacombs underneath Rome, you can see some of the pagan graves and they're etched goodbye for eternity, goodbye forever. But in the Christian catacombs that you find around Rome, it says good night until the morning, goodbye until tomorrow. There's, there's hope. And you know, this is what Jesus offers us. You don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be held in bondage to death because God can make something out of nothing. We're surrounded with evidence of his creative power all around us. The resurrection reminds us of that, and that's good news. I thought it would be good for us, appropriate for us, to just sing an anthem of praise in closing our service today. It's 166 in your hymnals. Christ the Lord is risen today. And uh, I'd like for you to sing with enthusiasm and energy this good news. Let's stand together as we sing.
How many of you believe the Lord can make something out of nothing? Yeah. That gives you and me hope, right? Yeah. He can take us and uh, realizing that we've got these stony hearts, He can give us new hearts, new spirits, new minds. He can recreate us, and the resurrection is a memorial of that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are thankful for the good news that Jesus is alive right now at the right hand of your very presence. They're interceding in our behalf in the heavenly temple, that he is there and he hears our prayers, that we can have our petitions answered in his living name. Lord, we pray that each of us can be recreated by faith in this truth, that you can make something from nothing, that your word has creative power and that it can animate new life into that which is dead and it can reanimate our hearts and minds. Bless us, Lord, that we might be mobilized by this truth. We also pray that we can all believe that eternal life, this gift, is given now and we can embrace it now and take it on from this point through eternity. Bless each person. We pray your blessing on this church and the families represented here and ask you go with us from this place through this Sabbath day and the week before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for this broadcast. If you've missed any of our Amazing Facts programs, visit our website at amazingfacts.org. There you'll find an archive of all our television and radio programs, including Amazing Facts Presents, Central Study Hour, Everlasting Gospel, Bible Answers Live, and Wonders in the Word. You'll also find a storehouse of biblical resources geared towards answering some of your most difficult questions. And our online Bible school is just a click away. One location, so many possibilities. AmazingFacts.org.